Shout out to the Noti Gang, Terion Brown, Tony Herrera, Xavier P. I appreciate you guys being the first ones on the last stream to make to drop a comment. Now, whether it be live streams or regular videos, be the first to comment in the live stream or the video, you'll be featured as one of the Noti Gang in the next video. Appreciate you, and shout out to you guys for being the first to jump in the last video. Good morning, and welcome back to Sip the Tally Films. I'm your host, Coach Evans. And today on Sip the Tally Films, we're going to take a look at the UDFAs, the undrafted free agents. And I'm going to give a grade to each one. And we signed so many this uh, offseason, well, after the draft, that I had to break it up into two videos. So this video is the defensive UDFAs and how I grade each one of them. You're going to get a basically an introduction to each one, a slight bio, uh, maybe your stats for that year. And then I'll go into the second slide, which will be, you know, the strengths and weaknesses and my overall grade for that person. So without further ado, let's introduce the defensive UDFAs for the Baltimore Ravens in 2023. We're going to start off with Dante Demas. A fan favorite from the University of Maryland, standing 6'3", 212 pounds, a native of Washington, D.C. Give you his stats for 2022. 22 catches, 233 yards, one touchdown. A little bit about Demas, his 2021 film is a lot better than his 2022 because he sustained a, a serious injury midway through 2021, which I think hampered his 2022. But let's get to his, well, my grade. On Dante Demas because we I watched a couple of games, actually did it after a live stream because people was going we were going back and forth about Demas because I said I didn't think he was that but that was before I watched him. All right for Dante Demas I gave him a grade of a C. Uh, his tools to become a high level jump ball winner his height his his ability to jump he has the tools to do it just got to put it all together. Strides in the build up and separates on over routes so the longer the route the more open he gets. Anything short intermediate he has a tough tough job getting open because of he has really no wiggle in his routes. Uh, pedestrian feet getting in and out of breaks. Hip tightness limits his ability to open and adjust. That's why I said his uh, he has no wiggle in his routes. His hips are so tight that he can't, a little uh, a quick hitch or a, uh, a basic, they call it a dig, or a 10 yard out. He, has, he struggles with those routes because it takes the hips to be able to sink quick, change direction and get up out of there. But the longer routes, the posts, the goals, the deep overs, the longer the route is, the more he tends to separate from defenders. Again, his stats again. So I gave him a grade of a C. And again, these grades are, it's kind of twofold. You got to kind of put the right situation with the team needs and how he plays. So that's why I gave him a grade of a C because there are going to be a ton of guys fighting for that fifth and sixth receiver spot. Do I think he's an A? And I saw, okay, let me explain this too. If I gave him an A, that don't mean I think he would make the team. I think he has a good shot of making the team because of team needs and his skill set. So that's, wanted to put that out there before it got misconstrued how these grades go. <laughs> but again, I gave him a grade of a C because he has a chance to fight for that wide receiver five, wide receiver six position. And it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough because he's, I ain't going to say he's a one trick pony, but you got multiple guys that can get open multiple ways. And you can't really just set in one spot unless you, unless you was a straight up speed guy that was quick in and out of breaks. That's different. But a long strider, he kind of reminds me, and I hate to put this on him, but Miles Borkin ish without the blocking ability. So, but we'll see. You know, a lot of locals like Dante Demas, and let's move on to the next guy. Next up, we have Takeem Doss from my undergraduate alma mater, Southern Miss, to the top. Back to business. 6'5", 373 pounds from Aliceville, Louisiana, Aliceville, Alabama. <laughs> Sorry about that. Southern Miss gets a lot of recruits from that Southern Alabama uh, region, especially the ones Auburn and Alabama don't want. They kind of get, they used to get first pickings over South Alabama, but now they've decided to invigorate their program. So now they fight South Alabama for recruits. But really, it's offensive lineman stats are hard to to find, so he really doesn't have any stats there. Uh, if I could have found like pancake percentage or win percentage or something like that, I would have put that down there, but I didn't. So let's move on to my grade of Takeem Doss after watching a couple games. And I watched a bunch of Southern Miss games. My little cousin plays receiver for him. He was a starting receiver next to Brownlee, uh, Casting, 
And so I watched a bunch of uh, Southern Miss games, not necessarily keying in on those, but I have seen them out there. Let's get into my grade. You'll see I have a grade of B for Takeem Dawson. I'll speak to that why. Uh, he can get a little wide in his hand placement, meaning his hands gets outside the frame instead of up under those pads and with those thumbs up. So he has just learned how to get on initial contact if they're not in perfect place to reset those hands. He settles in, settles well, I'm sorry, settles into his drop with patience. So during his kickback, he doesn't overextend. He waits to be a counter puncher. He lets the defender make their initial move, then he... In his mind, he has counters to each move, so he tries to put those in place once he does that. So you never really see him panic and, and, and overextend himself a lot. He handles power with power. So for those defenders that try to bull rush him, he just drops his hips and it kind of stops the bull rush. You know, with that with that frame, it's an ability to do that and to know how to do that because you can't just sit down. You have to know technically how to do it. He does that and prevents a lot of people from straight bull rushing. They have to go to counter moves to get past him. On the flip side of that, with that size and that frame, he doesn't get downhill as well as he should in run in the run game. What that means is, is when he initially fires off and gets his hands on guy on guys, he don't really finish them. And also, what that means is in double teams, when he has to get up on the second level, he just doesn't get there. He doesn't have the the foot quickness, the short area quickness to to get on the secondary guy that has any kind of speed about him. So those speedy linebackers outside linebackers he really has a problem getting up to them especially in the outside zone and stuff like that but it's a grade of a b and again it's a grade of a b because we have issues concerns left guard we, we don't know who's gonna start there future right guard we don't know what's gonna happen there we don't have a certain guy in place yet and he just comes into a, a program that he really has an opportunity to make the 53 or the practice squad because of the issues or the depth we need at offensive line so is he going to do it? I'm not sure, but it's a great opportunity for him. So that's why I gave him a B because that's the amount I think he can make the team with his skill set. So that's Tykeem Doss, uh, offensive lineman, from Southern Miss. Next up, DJ Galat. One of the better HBCU QBs that were, that were draft eligible. Uh, he's 6'3", 225 pounds from Bowie State, uh, hometown of Largo, Maryland. Stats for 2022. 207 completions, 337 attempts, 2,649 yards with 18 TDs and 8 interceptions. Dual threat, runner, great athleticism. Let's get into my grade of DJ Glock. Again, dual threat quarterback, very raw, extremely raw, throwing the ball, dropping, and in his reads. But he's very athletic, so it makes up for us. Maybe a one to two read guy didn't run. So what I saw on tape was him, you know, check his first read, check his second read, and then take off. Now, the takeoff wasn't necessarily because that was as far as he could read. He had to get up out of there. <laughs> he had to get up out of the pocket because the pursuit was coming. So, you know, the one, two reads, partly him, partly the O-line play. Uh, throws an, inac an accurate post route, not inaccurate. The the, the throw that stuck out the most to me that he can make is the deep post over the middle, especially once given time, threw that ball very accurate. There was some missed throws throughout that I felt like, you know, should be bunnies, but they were not hit. But I think his post route is his best route. And, again, his, his run to, running ability, I'm just to the point where I'm not going to put guys running. If they're a quarterback, I'm not going to talk too much about their running ability because I don't want it to seem like – they're running backs. We, we've been through all that before. So let these guys' legs be extra, which is what is tending to be in the NFL anyway. But, again, stats, you know, got the stats up there. I got him a grade of a D, though. And the reason the grade of a D is because I, he's too raw for what we got. And you got to think about this guy's going to go up against. And I got to list them all, so don't, don't, don't kill me with that. Lamar, A.B., Huntley. They he ain't got no shot, really. That's, you know, unless – Something happens to one of these dudes. He got he camp arm that can, you know, you maybe can develop and stash later on, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for DJ Galat, but I think the opportunity that he's getting here to 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 shine, you know, in the two or three, not two or three weeks, up until August maybe, we'll see. But great of a D because he, unless something happens, he really has no shot of making the, the team or the practice squad. Next up, we have Jake Gadone. 
six two, three hundred and four pound prospect from the University of Connecticut, hometown of Westwood, Massachusetts. Again, it's tough to find stats on the O line guys unless somebody lists pancakes, um, block win percentage stuff like that. But it's it's really tough to find stats on them. So that's why you don't have stats on. Get on. And I didn't even see like postseason awards or anything like that that I could put up there. So that's why that's not there. But offensive line prospect, which means, <laughs> you know, there's an opportunity for him. Let's get to the grade of, of get on. Play uh, his level of play is a concern. Started off as an Ivy League player, moved up to University of Connecticut as of recent. Uh, but his technique versus that that competition was good. Uh, play tackle and guard in college. Projects as a center in the NFL. Plays with good leverage and light feet. So in the the tape that I had to see of him at both levels, at um, the Ivy League level and at UConn, moved very well. Moved very well. His, his technique was sound. Had a good first step. Got guys turned on outside zones. Was able to work double teams hip to hip with 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 other linemen and get on the second level. But I think he'll struggle with strong with struggle with interior guys that are strong like DJ Reader and not necessarily the the pro bowl guys but any guy that just have that strong skill set he may not be a pro bowl level guy but if he just strong as hit i think get on will will struggle with those type guys especially sitting right over his head if he's a center but i gave it a grade of a c it's not a d because i think again we have issues with needing depth at o-line and anything could happen injury or he could be linda bum issue you never know not putting him on the pedal of linda bum but a smaller guy that you know can move well with feet, understands leverage. So you know we don't have, he could be the backup center. You never know. You never know. And that's why I gave him a grade of a C for uh, Jake Gidon. Uh, again, I want to say I got him listed as center because that's probably what he's going to play in the NFL. But he played both tackles and both guards in college. So that's the grade for Jake Gidon. Let's move on to our next guy. Next up, Brandon Kipper. Offensive line prospect from Oregon State, standing 6'6", 327, with a hometown of Caldwell, Idaho. Stats for Kipper, which is, I was able to find some stats on the old lineman finally. He allowed eight QB hurries all year, five QB hits, and only allowed one sack. Kipper's a tackle that protects as an inter- projects as an interior old lineman. He's effective when he's asked to pull, showing agility and speed. Kipper does a nice job of working with teammates to build a pocket, so... And what that means in pass rush situations, if he doesn't have a guy head up on him and he doesn't have an individual assignment, he does a good job of getting his head on the swivel and helping either inside or, or to his outside. But he played mostly tackle, so that's that would be mostly to his inside. Uh, he might play too high to move the guard, though. So, again, with that with that frame and that size, you'd think maybe he'd be a great guard with, the, with agility. But if he gets too high in his technique, the stronger defensive interior defensive lineman will just push him around and move him around. So you can't play – too high being an interior O lineman because those squatty bodies on the other side gonna get up under you and just create chaos. So I gave him a grade of a B again with the O line situation here in Baltimore. We don't know, you know, what's gonna happen. So all of these UDFAs that project as interior O linemen, I think they have a shot. Whether you come in as, as tackle and and gonna move inside, or you have the opportunity to be maybe the fourth or fifth tackle. So any of these O-line prospects that has have any ability to adapt to what Munkin is going to do, they have a shot because we don't know what type of lineman is going to be the prototype for what he wants to do because we haven't seen him call plays yet other than with other teams, not with this group of talent. Let's move on to our next guy. Next up is the University of Kentucky's Tayshaun Manning. You can see a couple of clips of Tayshaun Manning in action on my Twitter feed at Coach Evans9 on Twitter. Versus our, what round pick was he? I think our third round pick, the edge rusher from, from Ole Miss. You can see Manning in four clips versus, well, two clips versus our edge rusher we picked up in the draft from Ole Miss. 6'3", 327 pounds from Apopka, Florida. And again, stats are hard to come by for the whole line, guys. Let's get into what I think is a grade for Tayshaun. B again, <laughs> because of the situation, any old lineman that can come in and play a little bit, and not saying all old lineman all O line is not good, but the opportunity is there to at least make the practice squad on this team. One hold this year that we know of, 
two potentially, you know, next year that we know of, maybe even three with that same position at left guard now. But we need depth at that position because we don't need a huge fall off in case something something happens up front. We got to have enough guys to be efficient up front to get to the Super Bowl. Got to. I'm not saying he'll help us get there, but iron sharpens iron. So if these are, these guys come in knowing they can compete and have an opportunity to get on the practice squad with the down the line, the potential to get on the 53 for a game or two, I think the competition is going to be fast and furious. You know, they're going to get in there, you know, learn whatever needs to be learned, and they're just going to compete, which is going to make all of them better, whether they end up getting cut or not. He lacks range, but swallows up bull rushes without concern. That's because of that wide base, and you can see how wide the shoulders is just from that that picture right there. And see, wide frame with outstanding arm length, huge arms, well, not huge, long arms to be able to get out and get, get to guys that his feet won't necessarily allow him to get to. He's able to bolt down against bull rushes again. With that frame, that size, he's able to sink his hips. And when you try to bull rush, you basically need to try your secondary move, which probably would work on him because of his lack of athleticism. And his athletic limitations prevent him on long pullers and prevents him from cutting off the backside when out when they run an outside zone or jet sweep or stuff like that. And what that means is it's tough for him to get up to the second level to, to seal, which would in turn split the defense. And you need a backside guard or tackle that can get to – like a one technique and, and turn him around to open that gap up or to get to a backside linebacker to turn him and basically split the, split the defense so the running back will have a lane to run. But because of his limitations, it's hard for him to do that. So he's more so a, a gap power counter guy. But uh, I think with that being said, he has he has an opportunity because we run a lot of we ran a lot of that in the past. I don't know how much we're going to run this year, but in the past we've been a gap team and he would fit well in in a gap scheme so that's Tayshaun Manning from University of Kentucky moving on next up we have Keaton Mitchell East Carolina Pirates standing 5'9 185 pounds from McDonough Georgia 2022 stats 201 carries 1,452 yards with a 7.2 yards per carry with 14 TDs Fan favorite of a lot of people. Let's see what I think about Keaton Mitchell. So the ne- I'm going to start off with the negative. Unable to finish runs falling forward. But that's because of his frame. So that's going to be kind of expected. You don't have a bigger guy that's going to hit guys and continue to go forward, which is understandable. Acceleration is instantaneous, meaning he goes from 0 to 100 real quick, as according to Drake. Able to cut and burst in a single motion. Extremely quick. Short area quickness is off the chain. Able to get in and out of, well, not get in and out of breaks. I'm thinking about wide receiver play. But the dip and dodge behind blockers and once he sees daylight, hits it. I use his wiggle to beat tackles or by himself. So what that means is, and I kind of gave it away, he can fit behind blockers and see stuff on the other side and use those blockers as shields, which is what running back does anyway. But because of his quickness, he can set it up better. He can hit hard left, and when the, the backer or whoever that is trying to tackle, he can stick his foot in the ground and come out on the other side. Or if you get him in open field, he can just straight up make you miss because he got uh-uh-uh. And, you know, everybody don't get the 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 sound effects like that. But Keaton Mitchell got the uh-uh-uh to, to do what needs to be done, even if the blocking is not all that great. I think he has the opportunity to help us not only in the backfield and in the return game. His grade is of an A because I think the only person he has to beat out is Justice Hill. And if he can show work on special teams, this kid got a legit chance of making the 53. So I think Keaton Mitchell, running back from East Carolina, gets a grade of an A because I think he has an excellent position to make the team. And if I had to bet on any one of these guys offensively, I'd bet on him as making the 53, not just the practice squad. Next up, Nolan Henderson, a Delaware Blue Hen quarterback, 6'1", 195, out of Smyrna, Delaware. Stats for 2022, 285 attempts, or 285 completions, 442 attempts, 3,216 yards, 32 TDs, 9 interceptions. Not a lot of, not a lot of bad, check that, not a lot of good to say about Nolan Henderson. Simply, it's a camp on. And he led Delaware to the second round of the FCS, FCS playoffs, uh, accurate and intermediate balls, the, the Hitches, the the slants, the maybe the curl routes. Uh, struggles with the deep ball, but he is smart enough to get it off early enough to give his receiver chances to run under it. 
Uh, again, you see his stats and just with the situation, it's just a camp on him, I think. We got three solid guys there. You got him with the bringing in the guy from Bowie State. Camp arms. And that, I, that's me being nice. He's just a camp on. But again, for him, he gets a chance to go to an NFL camp, which is, I'm sure it would be a dream, a lifetime dream, a, 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 some, a goal, at least to get your foot in the door and have the opportunity. So, you know, no shade on him, just the situation. I don't think he has a snowball's chance in hell to make the team. But salute to you, Nolan. Next up, Owen Wright, 5'11", 225-pound fullback from Monmouth, uh, hometown of Bethesda, Maryland. His stats for 2022, 72 carries, 313 yards, 4.2 yards per carry, but 16 TDs, 16 TDs, um, a fullback. Owen Wright is basically a fullback, <laughs> a fullback now, <laughs> so Let's talk about a fullback. He's your typical full house fullback. The the want to call the dot guy and like full house and stuff like that. His goal line and short short yardage short yardage carries is what I think is his ceiling. As average to below average hands out of the backfield. He plays a dime position in the NFL, and the Ravens already have two fullbacks. We have Ricard. We have the kid from Michigan. Whatever I think it's Ben Mason. I think that's his name. It's D grade, man. It's, it sucks to be a fullback in today's football because it's tough to find positions. And now you just got picked up as a UDFA from a team that already has two. Not really sure where they're going with this, but again, just like Henderson, he has the opportunity to go to NFL camp, which is probably a dream of his, especially coming from Monmouth. And maybe he can make something out of it. Maybe he could put enough on tape for another team that wants a fullback to call him in and get him. So, Tough. It's gonna to be tough sledding. Definitely don't think he has a chance to make the the Ravens team, but maybe he can get enough on tape to get to another team that wants to have a fullback. But um, Owen Wright, running back from Monmouth. I should have put a fullback from Monmouth, but that's what he is a fullback. Next up, wide receiver Sean Ryan from Temple to Rutgers to West Virginia. <laughs> Been at three schools so far. Finished with Rutgers. 6'1", 200-pound receiver from Brooklyn, New York. 2022 stats, 26 catches, 440 yards, three touchdowns. Let's get into my grade of Sean Ryan. That's simple. Grade of a D with the guys we brought in on top of the guys that we already had here. Even though the guys that we had here are what we consider not the greatest, this kid can't beat any of those guys out. The only thing I found on this young man is a YouTube short. Great of a D. I, he's just going to be there to help the quarterbacks with drills, I guess. I I don't think he has a chance. I don't. It's not a lot of information out there about Owen. Um, stats are not impressive. Three schools in college. You know, and you transfer for whatever reason. I have my reasons. I don't know the kids, so I ain't going to put it out there. But the red flag for me is the three different schools. Let's move on. Next up, we have Jalen Thomas, offensive line prospect from SMU, standing 6'5", 326 pounds from Lubbock, Texas. Uh, again, stats were hard to find, but I did find some individual accomplishments for Jalen. He was the All-AAC AAC honorable mention and PFF second team All-AAC, and that's the conference that SMU plays in in college football. My grade for Jalen is a B. Again, any offensive line prospect that played mid-level to major college football, you have an opportunity with this team because of the three holes that I think we have. I think the only thing that's solidified on this team is left tackle and center at the moment. I'm not saying the other guys are not going to play, but there's going to be a hole there either now or for the future. And so any of these offensive line guys that can figure it out and put it together have the potential to be the 10th O-lineman or necessarily a practice squad guy. But get on that practice squad, learn the game, and not only could you have opportunity to make – the 53 later on or this next year, you're putting stuff on tape and getting in the good graces of scouts and whatnot to maybe get on with another team. As far as Jalen's individual, uh, what I saw on his tape, he varies his pass sets and generally knows when to be patient and when to get on top of guys quickly. So again, he he's 
he does fire out in that quick game stuff that SMU does. He he has the potential to get up on a guy quick. And even when they rarely do run the ball, uh, but when they have the deeper sets, uh, whatever their number protection is, man, three to five steps, he does a good job of just sitting there and being a counter guy, not getting overextended, not lunging and missing. He's just a patient old lineman. And when it's time to use those hands and be physical, he has this opportunity to do that. Uh, Thomas has experience in both left and right tackle, even though he projects to be a guard in the NFL. And SM, SMU's scheme didn't do him justice for the NFL because it was a lot of quick pass sets, a, a lot of quick passing game, a lot of screens. And so that's hard, that make it hard to evaluate O-linemen in systems like that. Kind of the same reason they say Jalen Hyatt and Hidden Hooker were hard to evaluate because of what the scheme that Tennessee does. Not saying he's on ca- that caliber of player, but just using it as a reference. I gave him a grade of a B. Again, offensive line, and with that last stat, I mean, with that last um, description, you really don't know what you're getting. He could be just what you need, and he could not be. But it's an opportunity for him to present it and show, you know, what he has and get that cloud, that great cloud from over him because of the scheme at SMU. Next up, Travis Vocalet, tight end from the University of Nebraska, the Cornhuskers. 6'6", 260 pounds out of Springfield, Missouri. 2022 stats, 20 catches, 240 yards, two touchdowns. My grade of Travis is a D. And I'll tell you why in a second. But he has soft hands. He has no wiggle in his route. So whatever the route is that's drawn on paper, that's pretty much what he's going to run. Uh, he's a big target with that frame. He's robotic. And we have too many tight ends on the team already. That's why he gets a grade of a D. We got the three main guys, and we, you know, and Ricard. It's, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for Travis to make the team. That's part of the reason why he has a D. Um, part of the reason is, is film. I mean, he looks robotic running across the field, catching the ball, then going down. It's, it's, it just look robotic. You know, no wiggle in the routes. No, he don't even get a, that's all. He barely can get that. But he, you know, he has he's a possession guy. Over the middle, he's gonna catch the ball, then take that lick and get out. Oh, you know, outside, right outside the hashes, catch the ball, take that lick and get out. Ain't much yet going on unless he just see you and run over you or fall forward. So for Travis Vocalek, who, you know, there's not a lot of film out there of him blocking, so I can't really even factor that in into it. Because if he was a blocker, that'd be more tape out there of him blocking. But great of a D mainly because we got too many guys and, you know, maybe he could be a practice squad guy, but I think the guy behind him may end up taking that practice squad position. And let's look at him. And the last offensive UDFA for today is Brian Walker. Tight end of the Shepherd Rams. 6'5", 240 pounds. Yeah, I pause because I have no idea where Shepherd is. That's, that's why I look like that. But he's from Clarksburg, Maryland. Uh, stats for last year, he's from a tight end now. Small school, 63 catches, 799 yards, five TDs. When I went and looked at the tape that I could find of Brian, I was very impressed with what I saw, especially after watching uh, Vokalek from Nebraska. Uh, Vokalek, how do you say his name? Different type of player. Brian's, Brian doesn't weigh as much, and it shows. Athletic frame, looks like a big wide receiver. He, when you widen him out from the hip position or, or inline, like, like an inline blocker or inline route runner, he looks just like a big receiver out there. He has some yak ability, especially right outside the hash. If you get him a good ball and he has the opportunity to turn up, he has the potential to make guys miss and extend that play another five to ten yards. Uh, definitely a receiving tight end over a blocking one. So he's there to catch balls, and you'll see he had 63 catches on last year. Uh, didn't jump out of the tape for me, so I didn't see him like dominate and just consistently be open. But I saw him, you know, when when he got good balls, he was able to get up the field, make plays, and has had a good set of hands on him. A hands catcher, not a body catcher. And again, over the middle of the field, right outside those hashes, you got to be a hands catcher because if that ball get up on you and pop up, it's potentially going to be picked off because of all the traffic in that area. But I gave him a grade of a D. And I probably should have been a C minus because I think he has a better opportunity to make the team than Vocalek because he has some yak ability. 
and he's able to move around in different positions. He could be out wide. He could slide in and be an H-back. He could slide in and be a wing. I think Brian has a better skill set than Volkolek, so that's why I think he's going to end up making that practice squad over Volkolek if they don't bring somebody else in that will beat both of them out. All right. Like the video. If you like what you saw and you have not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. And hit the bell so you can be notified when the rest of these videos drop throughout the 2023 offseason. This is my roundup of the offensive UDFAs the Baltimore Ravens picked up after the 2023 draft. My favorite UDFA is Keaton Mitchell from East Carolina. I think he has the best chance to make the team. My least favorite UDFA is Vocalek, the tight end out of Nebraska. I just don't I don't like his skill set for what we do with the tight end position. Even though we got a new offensive coordinator, he just doesn't fit the guys that are already there. He doesn't fit what Mark does or, or how Mark plays, likely how, how likely plays, or even uh, Kolar for that matter. I think Walker fits that mold better. And for that reason, my least favorite UDFA offensively is Volkolek, the tight end from Nebraska. <laughs> I had to remember. Uh, again, thank you guys for coming out. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you chose to be here with me. I appreciate all the support especially of recent shout out to all the new patreon members we'll get more film there soon and um we're gonna start working on the defensive udfas and try to get it out to you as soon as possible i appreciate everybody if you don't follow me on social media please do so at coach evans nine on twitter and sip the tally films on facebook and on ig and tiktok for that matter and uh, don't forget about more sip the tally or over there we are for type it in the comment section <laughs> and i'll see y'all soon man appreciate it if you made it this far in the video put hashtag keaton mitchell at the bottom in the comment section hashtag keaton mitchell or just hashtag who you think has the best chance of making the team let's do that at the end of the video hashtag that person whoever you think is the one that's a lot to make the team offensively not defensively appreciate you guys see you soon peace out